Okay, so we're going to do our first foray in a look at R.V. Young's At War with the Word, uh, subtitle Literary Theory and Liberal Education. Um, and I'm going to spend two classes on it. I would like to spend more, as I was saying before beginning the recording, because I think he really, um, in a very masterful way and very readable way, addresses what has been going on in the academy since the 1960s. But he gives us a little bit of a, of a, a history of what they're reacting against. And what they're rea reacting against is what's called the new criticism. Um, and I have not yet even spoken of the new criticism. Or I, I might have mentioned it, but I haven't actually taught it. And it's not actually a, a discrete lecture anymore. It used to be, but as I've taught this course, um, I have found that I need to add stuff later on because of the new literary theories. And it's meant that stuff that I used to have at the beginning have sort of let drop by the wayside uh, just because of time. Um, and I found that I backfill the literary theory not as a lecture onto itself, but, but through, the, through this um, book, among other things. So this will be effectively the this, this study of the new critics. And I'll give you a, a sort of uh, very short summary of it. But in a sense, what he says in there is true, which is that the new critics approach is so fun foundational to literary uh, studies that people just assume that's the way you do it. You read a text. Imagine that. You read a text and you think that the subject of the class is understanding what the text means, and th which is what everyone would assume in literature. Imagine that. You're reading the book and you think that the book is important and the, the book is not there to get you to talk about your feelings. It's not there to get you to talk about history. Uh, it's not get to get you there to talk about ideologies or so forth. It's just there to let you enjoy the book and to learn from what's being read in the book. That's the new critics assertion. That's the primary purpose of reading is to understand what's in the text and to be changed by the text in some way. Um, and that is just meat and drink of all literary studies and always has been, at least in the, the 20th century and I would say long before that. Uh, so it's not really anything new. It's a continuation of the humanities practice from time immemorial. But there's a, a re reaction against that within the American Academy and the European Academy post-1960s, and that's the leads to the title at war with the word. And he is, what he's doing, R.V. Young is framing it as a larger issue than merely taking issue with the new critics. It's at war with the word itself. And we can theologize that, which I will as well, and say it's not only at war with a way of reading, and it's not only a war against words, it's at war with, with Christ, the living word, ultimately. It's just a means by which that war is waged, and it's sort of a uh, unacknowledged war. And yet it's a highly effective one, because um, the idea of the word is so central to Christian theology that John's gospel announces God as the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And, and in English translations, we tend to capitalize logos there. And attribute, but a great deal of significance is attributed to words and to language. And that is at the central, that's the, one of the central features of the discussion of the humanities is how do we understand our human nature? Can we do it by means of words? Do our words have meaning and purpose? Um, are we ultimately comprehensible? Can we comprehend ourselves through language? Um, is the language that we use significant? What's the nature of language? Do, do words point to other words or do they point to things? This is the discussion that we 
had last semester when talking about Augustine, where he said that there were signs and things. Signa and race was his terms in Latin. Or are there just simply signa, signs and other signs? Uh, contemporary lit theory will accept the post-structuralist or the structuralist proposal that really it is just signs pointing to other signs that acquire their meaning through social convention. And, and I said enough about that last time, I think, not to have to recapitulate it. Uh, or I won't ever move forward. Um, but I did want to bring a couple paintings, uh, and I've got this behind me, the uh, Madonna of the Carnation here, because at the center here is a little carnation, and the Christ child is reaching out to the carnation. The car carnation is a central focus here, but obviously the two of them are as well. I just wanted to use this as a vehicle of illustrating to some degree one of the effects of that what I, what two classes ago I talked about the shift from the view from no uh, view from nowhere, which is a sort of the rationalism of the Enlightenment, towards the monism, the oneness of Romanticism, and I wanted to illustrate it with a painting because I think it it helps to visualize as well. Um, I'm told that everyone's a visual learner, which I think is a bunch of nonsense. Words help you visualize, but the but the paintings are a sort of pictorial representation of the thoughts that take place in our words. And I, I, I tend to think that words are um, more important because remember, although God is um, lived as a man, we know him through the word. And so I'm not going to accept that our best way of knowing things is through images. We're not to make graven images, in fact. Uh, many Christians take that very seriously. It, in, the, in the East, even more so than in the West, they don't have paint, the tradition of painting that we see arise in the Renaissance. They have icons, but that's a very different thing um, in accordance with their theology. And, and they, they're not to be con confused or conflated. Uh, it's an icon, not an image. But here we do have an image and it's representing something. I just want to note a couple features about it and then I'm going to show you an, another painting and, and how much the shift changes. But note here in <coughs> Da Vinci's Madonna of the Carnation, we have the focus front and center. And we have the typical sort of the triangle here, but this is a very strong focus of the Renaissance. It focuses on what is central to the poem it, or to the painting, it's front and center. It's obviously the Madonna. It is the bambino, the little Christ child, but it, it's the carnation and what the carnation represents. Now note also, so there's the focus, it's on human nature and the relation of the child to the mother. Very important, two people. <clears throat> One also that we cannot see, the father of the child. That's implicit and it's understood but highly significant as well. This is, this is a child without a human father, but with a heavenly father. Uh, but they are the focus here, and so is the mother's love represented by the carnation. And the carnation, interestingly, is connected to the incarnation. Carne, bodiliness, very important, uh, represented by the carnation as well. We also have a background here, but the background is, as the word suggests, it's background. It's not particularly important, but it is there. But we're not focusing on it. It's just in the background. And, and we'll see but this, this focus on persons and the significance of persons and incarnation in God's purposes is there throughout Renaissance art. You can see it uh, in the Sistine Chapel as well, this whole depiction of various scenes from scripture. Um, you can see it in the famous creation account of Adam and God, which, you know, the fingers almost touch, but the creation there, you get relation and you get, but again, you get a frontal uh, portrait. You see faces and persons. Note that we, the emphasis, their, their backs are not turned on it. 
uh, away from us. They're facing us. We see their faces. We see their expressions. The expressions matter. They reveal something about personhood. Very in-person, important that person has a face. And then we go to the, I think, the quintessential romantic painting from Caspar David Friedrich, The Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. And note the differences. First of all, the focus, although it is front and center here, is on a man whose back is turned to us. His identity is not connected to his face. And to some degree, although it is clearly a man, um, he is, insofar as his back is turned to us, somewhat androgynous. We're not really, we don't see his face, we don't see whether he has a beard or not, and that, that's not significant. What's significant is that his personhood is not connected to a face, an identifiable thing. He has a back to us, and what it, it's what he's looking at, which is the focus of the poem. Like he is modeling for us what is important in life, and what's important in life is what we see here in the background. So the background is the foreground, in other words, in romantic art. And what the background is, is nature, the world of nature, and he's at one with it. And he sees profundity in the fog. And yet senses within himself a, a union with it. But it, it's that world of nature that he feels himself in union with, that he's looking at, which is then the focus of romantic art. And I would argue the literature that follows it. Note also that he's a solitary. There are no other humans. We don't see his face. There are no other people. And um, I've noticed in various classes over the years here that the hero of post-romantic literature is almost always not just an individual, but an orphan. In other words, no mother child, but just an individual looking out into nature and seeing in nature his partner, his companion. And now this is the oneness that I talked about, the romantic. And, and again, the connection is not through a rational thing that you can observe. It's not through the eye. It's through feeling. It's through sentiment. And that will be presented artistically a bit further downstream in terms of like Monet with, with its uh, portraits of water lilies and, and so forth, which are uh, rather obscure. You can't see clearly. Here we have clear, bright lines. Very clear figures, proportion, etc. Here it's really in the fog that we find the, the focus. And my suggestion here is that this represents the war with the word that R.V. Young is talking about because the word gives clarity and precision and distinction. Words are distinct from other words because they're distinct conceptually and they refer to things that are discrete, not just the same as one another. They're categorically distinct. There's a cat, not a bat, or a cat or a dog. And they are uh, not to be confused. The categories are not to be confused because logic holds. It's not just the logos, but logic. And logic implies certain laws, and one of them is that of non-contradiction. The three laws of logic hold. And if they don't hold, then, then words are irrelevant and irrational. Words are just meaningless noises and signs and we move into a reiteration of a heresy that is found in the middle ages as well that of nominalism versus realism and we are moving into nominalism now once romanticism takes hold and the focus is on on the fog and the oneness that we have with nature and the words that reflect that oneness and the words that reflect it are particularly words like silence or words that suggest sublimity or the absence of utterance, it's unspeakable, we do get a sense of the profundity of mystery, but we also get a sense of the insignificance of the human being as well. 
and particularly the human being in relation to other human beings. It's very much of a, a solitary exercise. If that makes any sense. I think it does. I think it uh, is a, a great way of presenting it. And uh, note that there is an effect on human nature in this. We're not going to see the effect immediately in the 19th century, although it, uh, uh, there are some indications of it, but it's not full-blown. Full-blown it comes in our own age. Now we can see that human nature itself is also under attack. When the word is under attack, so is human nature because Jesus is the word and Jesus bears a human nature. He becomes flesh and lives amongst us. And so all of the aspects of what a word entails in connection with human being are all under assault. And so eventually there's an anthropological consequence to this focus on fog or oneness. So as I say, the enlightenment tends towards nothingness. The Romantic period tends towards oneness, but the effect is the same in either case. They obliviate difference. And they are both at war with the word, where we have clear distinction and difference. And a capacity for knowing the world and explaining it and living in it and making right distinctions. And among other things, being aware of God's creation of the world, but also his judgment of the world. The fact that he's not just the creator, but also the judge and the redeemer of the world. That is obliterated if everything is one and we move towards an articulation of love, not in terms of the Trinity or the, even the love of the Madonna for the child or the love of God by sending his son into the world to redeem us from our sin but rather of love as an expression of the emotions of this individual looking into the horizon that are very vague and have no ob object per se. In fact, they're just self-expression. Love is reduced to self-expression and the form of self-expression <coughs> is pretty much infinite, just like the horizon is infinite. So it recalibrates love as well. So every Christian doctrine gets transformed by this shift in perspective. The other thing that I'll no have you note about this, and again, this is a German writer, is remember we said about Immanuel Kant that he uh, himself describes his shift in perspective as a C Copernican one. Remember, Copernicus shifts the Ptolemaic perspective uh, where the Earth is at the center of the cosmos and suggests that rather, no, it's heliocentric, it's the sun. And uh, Kant makes an analogy with this and says, yes, let's try and do that. And the way we will counter the skepticism of David Hume, among others, is to imagine that the world, rather than being out there, and we determine its reality by looking outside of ourselves, let's imagine that the world uh, fits our capacities to perceive it. So it's, a sh it's called the subjective turn. And this is the product of the subjective turn. Kantian philosophy undergirds this shift in perspective. It's a consequence though, and it's an inevitable consequence, I, I'm asserting, of what happens in the early 18th century with, with shifting language to just being a human product and, and divorcing it from revelation, where it was clearly situated in Augustine's thought. And that's why Augustine was so important last semester as he talked about the significance of revelation, and then he talked about the liberal arts that arose out of it, although he didn't spend a great deal of time in the liberal arts, but it was, it was implicit. He wrote, a, he wrote a treatise on music with Augustine. He probably would have written treatises on the other as well. He writes on rhetoric, uh, but he doesn't get into grammar and logic too much, let alone astronomy. That's not, I mean, he wrote enough things <laughs> without getting into all that, but he clearly is saying that the liberal arts are implicated in revelation and become validated by revelation as well. Whereas this denies revelation, except natural revelation, but when it means natural revelation, it's not talking about nature as a discrete bunch of things. It's talking about race, nature as a unity without discrimination, without distinction, or without real distinction. 
other than that what society decides is going to be the discriminations, and those are totally arbitrary in the sense of arbitrio, the will, just up to the will of society. So that's, I think, a visual way of representing the shift here. And I'm just going to look at chapter one today from R.V. Young, the old new criticism and its critics, um, because I think that it is really important, particularly since I haven't actually talked about the new critics in the class. And um, I think I need to say something about the new critics, uh, because really the uh, academy in, uh, and the study of English, both in the United States and Canada and in the UK, uh, arises from its foundation in the new critics. And the new critics are, are basically a continuation of the humanities tradition of the classical world. Now, I have my objections to the new critics as well. They're insufficiently Christian in, their, in fleshing out their presuppositions as far as I'm concerned. They try and adopt the methodology of the Enlightenment and don't give enough credence to the prejudices that we bring to bear even when we read a text. We always are committed to certain, a certain understanding of faith and reason or Christ and culture. That's always there in the background and we can't simply assume, although I guess in the UK in the 1930s and 40s when T.S. Eliot's writing uh, or C.S. Lewis is writing or um, F.R. Levis is writing, or in, in uh, the U.S. in the 1930s and 40s when the new critics are writing in the American South, they assume a Christian context. Their, their readership are Christians, and so we, can, we don't even have to deal with that sort of stuff because we assume that everybody is Christian who's reading in English in our context. They could simply assume that. In the 21st century, in 2024, we can't assume that of our audience. Many people read, it, read English, for whom English is a second language even, but even for those who it's a first language, they're, they're not Christians. They don't think and don't assume that the Christian view of life is true because they've never even heard the Christian view of life. It hasn't been taught in schools. Um, it's, it, it simply cannot be assumed, let's just say that. And so the new critical approach was may be useful in its time, but it's not useful in our time. We need, some, uh, we need a reiteration and a more fulsome theological articulation of what the new critics do when they look at the text. But I said, uh, from my perspective, what the new critics propose in looking at a text is unobjectionable otherwise, which is simply when you read Shakespeare, you're there to read Shakespeare <laughs> and to understand what Shakespeare has written and to take delight in what Shakespeare has written insofar as it's meaningful and profound and beautiful and moving, etc., you're there to read Shakespeare. You're not there to read what the critics say about Shakespeare. That's entirely secondary. You're there to read the author them, himself. And, uh, and that ought to be your, your main focus. And the, the, the reason we, why we read Shakespeare is because he is in some ways profound or aesthetically supreme. There's, some, there's a height, an artistic excellence, which will distinguish Shakespeare from a cultural document written at the same time. So it's not because he's, it's 16th or 17th century uh, chronology that distinguishes it. It's because his writing is superb. It, it, there's something sublime about it in the Longinian sense. Something great, a grandeur of spirit, a nobility about what is being told. That's why we read Shakespeare. Uh, the, the new historicists, which he averts to, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on, they will say that what's more important is that Shakespeare is an articulation of uh, his culture at the time, and we can read other documents alongside of him. Written by you know, commoners, written by women, written by um, you know, matters of insignificance, we should read those as well. At that point, we're no longer reading literature at all. We're just reading cultural documents and we're engaging in cultural studies. And uh, that's just one of the many objections to uh, the new critics is they seem to think that there is such a thing as literature. It's the very same thing that we saw that um, 
our friend, um, uh, oh gosh, what's his name, that we've been reading as the, as the textbook, uh, Terry Eagleton, suggested that maybe there isn't such a thing as literature. It's a category that originated in the 18th century or the 19th century, which as I've said to you already is a bunch of nonsense. It's a long-standing, um, widely recognized uh, phenomenon. And it will be associated with poetry and also with rhetoric, and eventually with prose. We will acknowledge that there's a certain type of prose that's artistic, like Jane Austen. And we'll want to say that Jane Austen is great literature in a way that most contemporary novels are not. There's an excellence there. There's a, a moral sense to what she says. She acquaints us with an enduring world that we can live in and recognize and learn from. It teaches us something as well as delighting us. Um, but the, and the new critics simply assert that there is something called literature. That's what is most objectionable. <laughs> They, they think that there is literature, that we benefit from reading it, and here's where our friend Harold Bloom will agree with them, but they will think that there's more to it than simply beauty. And they will also object to the idea that the purpose of literature is that of the Gnostics, which is that we need a sort of a secular elite, a priesthood like Harold Bloom to um, introduce us to it and uh, to be the mediators as it were because that's effectively what he's arguing you people don't understand and I, I the purpose of the academy is for me to read books I like to read which <laughs> is a rather selfish way of presenting it and it denies that in in great literature there's something that we can actually access and appreciate without the mediation of a critic and I think that there is, although I do think that critics, when they really understand their uh, vocation, are there to help you understand the text better. And some great illustrations of how uh, literary criticism is done well, I think C.S. Lewis is, is exemplary in this. You read his works, and they help you go to the original work and appreciate what's being written there. That's what a, a, a secondary critics should do. And that's what I try and do in my classroom. I'm here to help you understand what, what the text is saying, not to voice my opinions upon it, or let alone suggest that I'm the text that you're to be listening to. It's, and so I read the text at length often to try and illustrate the points that are being made. And the new critics in general do this. Uh, they, they will focus on the text. And this is called formalism. Uh, Young says, and so you, whenever you hear in the post 1960s critics attack formalism, this is a way of criticizing the new critics because the, the new critics are interested in the literary form, whereas the, their opponents are interested in context and also content. But they're attacking the form. And the new critics are simply saying, it's not that the context is irrelevant and the content is irrelevant, but rather that the form is the vehicle for delivering the context and the content. And if we don't look at the form, the literary form, then art is no different than reading a newspaper. It's just less artistic. And you want to get rid of everything that's artistic about the art. And whether you want to be a new historicist that's going to focus on context. Better that springs off that than pulls the whole thing down. A new historicist will fo focus on the context. Historical context is all the new historicists are interested in. Or if you want to focus on the content divorced of the form, uh, in both cases, you're attacking the form. And so uh, the focus of formalism, which more or less is my 
approach in teaching literature will emphasize everything that the Hellenistic critics thought was important. Genre, great authors, great books as examples of this, but also, um, and I'll contextualize them, say this is a Greek novelist and they have a certain religious view of life, which I don't share, but we need to understand that in order to understand they're dealing with metaphysical matters or theological matters and we can see where we differ from them but let's not pretend that they're Christians writing and if because if they're Christians they're really bad Christians let's read them as as if we were Greeks what does it mean to do that well we have to understand their context then and that will explain the content we have multiple divinities speaking here and they'll write in the form of an epic and the epic has certain conventions attributed to that and we will start to follow those and we'll find later authors will adhere to these same formal conventions and then what will arise from this is texts, great texts, certain foundational texts that refer to other texts. And this is not the same thing as signs referring to other signs. It's texts referring to other texts and the texts that we read in some ways, and, and Young points to this, and I agree with him on this, demonstrate a sort of a human freedom. Freedom is one of the great things that these texts articulate to us, the importance of human freedom. But I do think there's more than that. I also think that they represent virtue. They exalt virtue. They demonstrate it and they commend it to us. And in both cases, they see freedom and virtue as essential human concerns that we must see is at, uh, at risk in engaging with the world. And they're, the, the heroes fight for virtue. They're virtuous and they fight for liberty and the shackles of liberty can come in manifold forms. It can be an internal struggle, like in Paradise Lost, right? A, a war against sin, but sin is something that is passed on through Adam's original sin, so there's a war within us, or it can be external. There can be an external war of sorts um, against those that would assail liberty, like the Greeks do when they square off against the Persians. They're fighting for a, the Greek way of life which defends freedom and the polis and the conditions of the polis. Or you can see in biblical terms, in terms of the emancipation from slavery, the slavery of Egypt, but the slavery of Egypt is a bondage not just to a, a place or a particular individual, Pharaoh, but it's also a war against the slavery of sin, which is um, individually represented by Pharaoh. When it takes its full head, it has a political, worldly manifestation, but there's a bigger problem of sin that you need to be delivered from. There's a Pharaoh in your life to this very day, and it's not the prime minister of the country. It's the sin that rules your life. That's the Pharaoh you need to be delivered from, and you need to be delivered from that bondage and brought into the pr promised land. So now this is an allegorical way of reading, right? But you can see that emerging in the Middle Ages, exactly this sort of analogy and this sort of allegory of, uh, as a way of reading even the texts of the Greek world. But that is the approach of formalism that the postmodern literary critics are at adamantly opposed to. They, they hate the idea that there is a form. And when they are against form, what they are implicitly against, or and sometimes explicitly, and R.V. Young is very good on this, is they're actually against word. They're at war with the word. When they're at war with form, they're at war with the word. Because, a w again, words formulate and create form, and the form distinguishes things. We have a Madonna, we have the Bambino, the baby Jesus, and we have a carnation. This is the Madonna of the carnation. The background is just that. It's background, it's not important. Once the romantic shift takes place, we see that the background becomes the foreground, and human nature is 
effectively effaced from a focus of the humanities. And rather than the words or the reason of this man, it's the feelings of this man looking at the immensity of the sublime landscape, which are the focus of art. And, and in terms of painting, we move from, from Friedrich's presentation more and more towards abstract art and eventually to blank canvases, where, where the form is totally eradicated. And in, in terms of music, we'll note the exact same thing. John Cage has a, uh, has a performance and it's just silence. It's an extraordinary thing. I, can, I, I, I would have loved now to imagine what it would have been like being the audience there and you're just sitting there. Because after a while, you're like, you, it's polite and you know, this is high culture. You're going to see this famous com the composer and then there's just nothing and people are just like... And then you, you hear the shuffling of the audience and people have their rappers and... So you'll hear that and you don't hear anything else. Anyway, it, comment or question? You know, um, the something that uh, the presentation of the art in the beginning made me think about was um, uh, uh, I noticed that in the Renaissance period, and I don't fully understand why, but there seems to be a focus on uh, the physicality of the human being. Like when I look at The Last Judgment from Da Vinci, and it seems as though uh, the presentation of the Lord Christ is very uh, different than the traditional. He's muscular. He's like he's like yes. And everyone is uh, is 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 very focused on how the human being looks, or maybe how a human being should look but doesn't look right now, or something. But I'm curious because I'm thinking that maybe uh, when we see the romantic period. There is much less, as you were saying, sir, uh, uh, focus on the human being. So I was wondering what caused in the Renaissance uh, such a focus on uh, the human being and whether maybe it was like uh, uh, a shift, as a, a pendulum shift from one extreme to the other extreme. Well, it's, it's clear. So here, here we have David. David's a biblical figure. He's portrayed here. Uh, as a youth, boy, it's quite the muscular youth. Note that how big his hands are, by the way, as well. It's extraordinarily large hands. I'm not quite sure why that is, other than he's trying to suggest that he's going to get even bigger. He's like a lion cub where they have these enormous feet, and then he's going to grow into the hands or the feet. Um, maybe that's it. I have no idea exactly. Um, doesn't seem to make a, a lot of sense. But the extraordinary muscularity and the sense of the beauty of the human form is very much a part of this. And there is a little bit of, um, a little bit too much humanism in the Renaissance. It's, it's more man-centered than God-centered. The Reformation is a different thing. It's a theological movement and it comes in the light of the Renaissance and, it, and to some degree it focuses on what the Renaissance thinks is, is great, which is the beauty of human nature. But it starts to move the focus from God to man and um, and it does present man in a very muscular way, which you don't get in, um, quite frankly, in the art of the medieval period. They're not interested in the muscularity of men. In fact, well, in, in art, they're not even interested in uh, exactitude and proportion and so forth. So medieval painting, I mean, we don't have, I mean, I look at them all rather than just one. It's not they're unrealistic, although sometimes they are. So this, look at this one, why they look so ugly. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not gonna answer that. But note, <laughs> boy, that is an ugly baby. Well, it's because it's a little fat, it's a little old man. Right, so we have a baby and it's a man who's lost his hair. Right, and he's just little. And he's looking up and he's like, boy, that's... So and the mother is not, is not a great looker either. But again, it's representing something. It's not, it's not the ideal of beauty being pre presented here in medieval art. There's something different being shown here. It's not that they can't portray babies better or they don't want to portray a baby at all. They want to portray, you know, an ugly middle-aged man who's losing his hair when they portray Christ. It's something else is that, you know, with a funny 
tunic on as well at that. Yes. To look uh, as though uh, he's wise, so they put right. him with uh, wrinkles. Foreheads yeah, big, and big forehead. Uh, and they, and they, and they, and they, and it's a sign of even though he is finite as a child, he's, he's sapient. Really, he's wi- He's wise. He's, he's all knowing. Yeah, he's got a. Yeah. He's got a mega head. Yeah. 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 Like mega mind, yeah. Right. <laughs> 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 um. And again, it's representing something and everyone understands who understands the art. They're not trying to depict beauty in a visual term. They're trying to depict the meaning and significance of those being portrayed. So they're moving away from the representation tradition of um, of a copy, a perfect copy or the ideal human form. It's the significance of Christ in the paintings. Whereas when we move to this period, it really does get the ideal human form and it's the external thing and so it's moving away from the significance of christian theology in the portraits even while it's still portraying christian um, ideas like here in the creation look at all these different scenes or here very theological in one sense but it's more realistic we have a, a genuine this looks like a baby i mean it's a very fat baby been well fed boy, well fed, but still, this is a baby, recognizably. It doesn't look like a fat old man, or it doesn't look like a child with enormous head. It looks, the proportions are that real, realism. So there's a realism to life without the influence of theology. And that is allegedly a correction of something that's going wrong in the medieval period, but is it a correction? Or is it a distortion because it's moving away from Christian doctrine? I think the Renaissance is the start of a move away from Christian doctrine. I'm curious whether the, uh, uh, the Romantics were trying to correct the Renaissance. No, they're trying to correct the Enlightenment. They're trying to correct the yeah, Renaissance. I don't think they're trying to correct the Renaissance. Oh. I don't think they're, that you never read, well, I, I mean, I'm an expert in the Romantics and they never write against the Renaissance. Hmm. They always, if they do criticize, they criticize the rules hmm. of neoclassicism, perhaps, but they're really a, their main objection is that it's, it's rational. Mm. Now, the Renaissance also emphasizes reason and proportion, but that's not what they mean by that. They mean a certain type of reason that they see in the Enlightenment. And the certain type of, of reason is addressed when we get to the real importance was sort of feeling rather than reason. I mean, people could disagree, but I, I, I never see a critique of the Renaissance. They love the Renaissance. They love Shakespeare. So it's not the view of the focus on humanity, but it's the, the emphasis that they... It's the emphasis on the visual as the determining factor. But they also wish to emphasize the feeling, and so this leads them to, uh, 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 to sympathize more with nature. Well, to see a union between themselves and every other thing. So they're not going to accept the theological view, which is also the classical view, that man is a very different animal than the other animals. Very different. And the main point of difference, and there are more than one, but one is that he possesses reason. That'll be Boethius. That, you know, and, and Augustine. They'll say that reason is the thing that distinguishes man from the other animals, um, although they won't use that phrase, the other animals, but reason is the distinctive human attribute. And they will also say that, so, and so is personhood, right? It's all rooted in Trinitarian thought. God is person, tri-personal, therefore, ipso facto, since we're made in his image, we are persons. And persons have faces, and animals don't have faces. Now, it's hard for us to grasp, but animals don't have faces. They, we, we attribute them faces and oh look at him, look at him expressing his emotions. You're, you're imagining something that's not there. They don't have faces. They have, they, they're not made the same way. Like they're, the eyes are on the side even. And they don't look at things. They, they don't have the same capacity for seeing the way that we do and they don't express emotions through their faces the way we do. We, we have a, like an seemingly infinite variety of expressions on our faces that reveal a great deal about what's going on inside of us. Animals don't do that. It's not that they don't feel anything. So it's not feeling. Animals have feelings. 
like they, the sensations, you hurt them and they cry out. And if they're deprived of something, they're upset, they're anxious, but they don't express their feelings in an articulated way, which we do through facial gestures. So faces are very important and covering faces like we did under COVID-19 is also a dehumanizing thing. And I strongly objected, if only for that reason. And cultures where they don't want to acknowledge people's human rights, they're very happy to cover their faces. Not as a condition of a particular like a threat, like lockdown, but fundamentally, you're going to hide your face. And it dehumanizes the person concerned. C.S. Lewis is great on this until we have faces. It's, I think a, talking about the significance of words, the word, and also faces and persons. Here we don't have persons, we have individuals atomistically conceived. Their backs turn to us looking into the foggy distance. And this is at war, not just with reason, but with the word. Because as I've repeatedly stated in my classes on romanticism, and in other classes, because I bring it up over and over again, because the romantics influence everything that we say and do. We think that literature is really about feelings and self-expression. And who are we to deny the, self, the, the, the validity or the grandeur of somebody's self-expression that differs from us? Because at, at root, it's all about feeling and f everybody's feelings are equally valid. Love is love, etc., etc. That that appeal to feeling, to love, to validity, to self-expression are all appeals to romantic postulates that are at war with the word. That's the beauty of R.V. Young's book. It draws attention to that. Now, the attention is drawn to a particular group of critics that he calls the new critics that articulate this view. But behind that is the very helpful title that points us to something greater being at work than merely a questionable literary theory. That's, that's in a sense, a, a small potatoes by comparison. But he defends, and I think quite ably, and if you've read any of the New Critics, which I have um, at considerable length, in fact, you're going to see that the New Critics are basically straw manned all, all, all the time by their opponents. They say the new critics are only ever appealing to the form and they say they never want to consider context, they never want to consider content, they just want to look at form. And they, have you actually read any of what they write? They never say that, ever. They simply want to say the main focus of literary study is the text and it's not the context and it's not even the content. If it were content, then it would be the history of ideas. We'd be in a philosophy class. We're not in a philosophy class. We're in a literature class. The, word, the words on the page matter. That's why we memorize it. Commit to memory. Same reason we do it with scripture, by the way. Scripture is not just articulating uh, systematic theology. Otherwise, we would just throw the Bible away and we would read a book in systematic theology or we'd read the commentators on the text and not regard the text as having a particular um, irreducible significance that must be read. It has a certain effect on it. And again, that's because we regard revelation to be the word of God. And here we don't regard the works of Shakespeare to be the word of God. However, because he bears the image of God and because he's a great artist, the form that he writes in deserves our attention or we have no art at all. We have what uh, Macbeth says when his wife dies, words, words, words. Actually, that's not, that's Polonius. He says that life's a tale told by an, an idiot signifying nothing, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. That's Macbeth's statement upon hearing the news of the death of his wife in Act 5 of Macbeth. Tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. That's an expression of his nihilism, his despair. That's not a, a Shakespeare's expressing his own view, it's he's expressing the character of a man for whom 
the signs that were given by the witches at the beginning have been taken to be determinative, fatalistic, and moral value, which is, and freedom and virtue, the things that guided Macbeth's life, he is cast uh, and said, there's of no significance, I'm gonna go for power, get what I want, and then act thereafter as if I can live a life of freedom and virtue, and we find that he can't. And he keeps on annihilating everything around him until there's nothing left, and his wife, who is in despair, takes her own life, and Macbeth expresses that same sense of despair. Macbeth, I submitted, I think, in the class, is a very great illustration of what goes on in the humanities over the past couple of hundred years. It's an attack on the word, and it's an attack ultimately on human nature, because God himself, the word of God, becomes flesh and lives amongst us full of grace and truth. Now, what's really interesting, and I noticed this a few years ago when I was teaching the course, and this is just a sidebar, but that C.S. Lewis is called the chief defender of freedom and virtue by none other than B.F. Skinner, the behaviorist psychologist, and he hates what Lewis represents. He says this is the obstacle to human progress. And human progress will take place when we cast aside our adherence to freedom and virtue as being the central concern of education and move towards conditioning. And in other words, the human sciences, let the human sciences, the psychologists, take over the education of humanity and will actually condition the responses and, and stop appealing to the importance of virtue and stop valorizing freedom as the most important fight in the Western world. So it really is at war with the word. Now, but, and now I've connected it to the Geist des Wissenschaft and specifically in the form of Skinner's um, book written in 19, after C.S. Lewis is dead. I would love to have seen Lewis's response. Write it while he's alive. Anyway, he doesn't need to. Uh, his works stand alone on their own. And But it's very interesting that the uh, psychologist, the behaviorist, uh, the, the chief represent, representative of the human sciences in his day, or at least one of them, B.F. Skinner, is, identifies freedom and virtue as the main thing that Lewis writes about in his words, everywhere, in his apologetics, in his fiction, in his literary theories, literary criticism. He's pointing us to the importance of Milton's words, trying to explain what the words mean. He thinks that the words mean something that we can understand those words and we can benefit from the distinctions that Milton makes, theological and otherwise. So it's, and, 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 and Lewis is effectively, by writing, say, Preface to Paradise Lost, telling us that Wirt Milton's text is meaningful and matters and we need, to do, we need to attend to the words and we need to understand it, but he gives us context. Note that. And the context is he writes an epic, and he acquaints us with the primary epic and the secondary epic. He also gives us something of the content when he explains Milton's theology, which he'll point to Augustine. He'll talk about why Adam and Eve are portrayed the way they are. He'll talk about why Satan, sin, and the devils are portrayed the way they are. Why the angels are portrayed the way they are, etc. And he will be pushing against the misconceptions of what's going on in those texts, misconceptions that have been hatched by romanticism, because the romantics are the chief uh, individuals that misrepresent what's going on in Milton's text, because they think Milton's Satan is the hero of Paradise Lost, because, because as a true artist, as Blake puts it, Milton was of the devil's party without knowing it. And why was he of the devil's party? Because all true artists are opposed to fixity or doctrine, or in other words, words, they really are trying to articulate feelings. The primacy of feeling which is presented to us in the imagination. So that's what's going on here in the first book. Um, and if you want to read more from the New Critics, I mean, he, he mentions a number of them here, uh, and as well as the, and he, he's taken some very um, well-chosen paragraphs from 
the new critics as well as their opponents and, and then t pick sides on it, which is he defends the new critics against their critics. And I think he does an able job of that. But if you want to read more on that, read some of the new critics that he mentions, Wimsat and Beardsley. Um, Monroe, uh, Rene Wellick, you could say, although Wellick leans in the uh, structuralist direction. But still, these are defenders of the text and the form of the text in particular. So there is a sort of a new criticism that is related to form. And I effectively, I'll tell you right now, if you or wondering why we didn't explain what new criticism was in the class, I give it to you every class. The assumptions that I'm making by teaching the class are my approach to the new criticism. I give you theology on top of looking at the text. But the focus is still on the text. If it weren't, then I would be moving from this text to talk about scripture and teaching Bible, which I would be very happy to do, but that's not what I'm tasked with doing here. I'm tasked with showing you how the Bible influences culture, because that's what's going on. Uh, or, or hasn't influenced culture if I'm looking at the Greeks. Has not yet influenced culture, and so therefore, what is Homer's worldview, to use that language? What, it, what, what does he assume about the world, and why do Christians appropriate the view of great literature that we have inherited from the Greeks and the Romans, because that's what we've done. Why did we do that? And I'm going to tell you this is why, because they understand freedom and virtue, and they, they exalt it, and they present it, and we believe as Christians that this is very important in human nature. It was, it is, and it always will be. It will be a battle for freedom, won through ordered liberty, ordered by virtue. And what constitutes virtue will change from age to age. I don't want to relativize it too much. It will change between the classical period and the Christian. So the Christian virtue par excellence is humility. Never there in the classical world. And the only reason that Christians think it is because Christ humbled himself to become a man in the incarnation. Help but laugh at the portrait. Um, and even more so in the atonement. God who transcended all things, who existed outside time and space before ever anything existed, he existed, he becomes a finite human being and gives himself over to death for our sin on the cross. So that's so humility is the chief human virtue that thereafter, hugely transformative because it will start to affect all the other virtues then. What does it mean to be courageous? It will be courageous marked by understanding that your chief opponent is sin, not a Goliath per se. David's opponent Goliath was a large, huge opponent. And he was just a man with a, in his hand, a little slingshot. Very brave. Yes, but how much more brave is it to face this opponent that we cannot defeat? We need David's greater son to defeat that enemy, right? So he's a type of, the, of Christ. And the enemy that Christ defeats is sin and death. Both of them are defeated. So all those are calibrated in accordance with the new great human virtue, which is that of humility. But still, we're going to agree that freedom and virtue with the classical age are the essential concerns of great texts. Great texts will focus on freedom and virtue, and, the, and that will determine the text that we actually choose in many ways to show that grand battle of freedom and virtue being played out over the course of human history. And it will have great exponents, and they will come from all tribes and nations. But there is a certain legacy, and a, the, the texts that we, we value are 
often texts that are in interplay with the foregoing texts, at least in the Western tradition. When Christianity spreads out in the 19th century in the missionary movement, the worldwide missionary movement, countries that were not Christian and have now had the gospel declared to them will start to be changed by that and again we'll get a what was called Western literature will become world literature. But again, it will still be the, the battle of freedom and virtue. And virtue, for me, must be normed by Christ's all-surpassing virtue. And we will be like Paul's slaves for Christ. Douloi Christu. Tyndale's model. Imagine that. Because in the slavery to his righteousness, we're free. That's the understanding, right? Um, so anyway, the, uh, do you have any comments or questions about, I mean, I, I said to you before, I mean, you came in a little bit late because of traffic. I'm just going to deal with chapter one here today. Next class, I'm going to deal with chapters two and three and deal with deconstruction. He says very important things about that. <coughs> and then I'll try and pick up some of the later chapters, new historicism, constitutional interpretation and literary theory. So the application of this r reading of texts to uh, to law and government and so forth because th it is a downstream consequence of what goes on in literary theory, what happens in ordinary life. And this is why what goes on in the academy cannot be ignored outside the academy, even though it was for a very long time. Now nobody can ignore that from the academy came the idea that we can self-identify our own nature and then we can get doctors to come in and give us gene therapy or hormone therapy we can cut people up so that their sense of their self will fit their sense of their self which is not based on what's in front of them but rather on what's inside of them no you can't see what's on his front this could even be a woman I mean, it isn't, but it could be. He's got a great coat, signs out. You can't tell whether he's got hips or not. <coughs> the hair is relatively short. Well, women can cut their hair short. You, you can't see his front. And that's because the front's irrelevant. If there's an individual, and you're only seeing what he sees. And that's what's important about this person now. He's not a person at all. He's an autonomous being feeling an organic connection to the world around him. He's no longer a person at all. He is an observing organism. And the, the nature that he has will be one that he has to create like a self-interpreting orphan. He will have to explain for himself what the meaning of life is and then live in that reality. Any questions about chapter one or comments about it? It talks about all sorts of critics that I'm well acquainted with and spent so much time in my doctoral thesis. Um, but uh, I don't even know where to begin. I, I, I just want to read the whole book out to you. But he did, he did note, and I thought this was interesting on page 14, uh, the shift towards Gnosticism. So he says, although the language and tone of the current university setting are broadly Marxist, it is perhaps most helpful to conceive the radical predilections of the modern world according to the Gnostic paradigm formulated by Eric Vogelin, who's a political theorist. Gnostic dualism both despises the material creation, which we can see through gender, the articulation of gender as opposed to sex, as if gender and sex were not related in any way whatsoever, Gender is totally distinct from it. Could be an infinite variety of genders, but there are only two sexes. Um, it despises the material creation and sees it as decisive in forming the character and conduct of human beings. The evil that men do is not attributable to the sinful will of the individual. It is rather an intrinsic and hence inevitable result of physical existence, which is why there is a rebellion against physical existence. specifically human physical existence. They don't care about the world. In fact, the rebellion against physical existence by the Gnostics of our day aims to eradicate human beings from the earth. It 
This aspect of Gnostic belief, he writes, is reported not only by its ancient Catholic enemies like St. Augustine, but also by sympathetic contemporary commentators like Elaine Pagels, and I would add Harold Bloom, who is a Gnostic. That's why I said there's huge irony in having the defender of the tradition of literature being a Gnostic. At the same time, the Gnostics also believe that those who attain to a special knowledge or gnosis or gnosis become part of an elite group who rise above the condition and destiny of ordinary mortals. Combine this with empirical science and technology and the result looks very much like modern Marxism. The entirety of human reality, including the superstructure of culture and society, derives from the material forces and conditions of the economic infrastructure. Individual human beings and all their relations with their fellow creatures are thus products of physical causation, as in the mythology of Gnosticism with its wicked creator Demiurge, the material world is an essentially evil place where the lives of human beings are reduced to a condition of miserable servitude to the necessities of physical existence. Now, he presents it in terms of a, a, an attempt to emancipate a, us from matter. But somebody like B.F. Skinner will do the exact opposite. They, he'll want to reduce us to matter and the, and the Richard Dawkins Likewise, they want to see us that and it's this interplay that I've talked about for a couple of classes now between the one and the zero. There's either absolute somethingness, monism, or there's absolute nothingness, nihilism. And effectively, they entail the same thing. So if you think the material is everything, then there's there's nothing really left. It's just nonsense. Materialism is self refuting. Really, it's just nonsense. Whereas rationalism with no material is also going to annihilate material existence. Like he says, the Gnostic approach. The Gnostic approach is an extension of the Enlightenment's commitment to pure reason. And how, how pure? It will purify us from all prejudice, including the prejudice of the body. So they, though they hate each other, this, the oneness versus the nothingness, effectively they, they move to the same outcome and at war, what they're at war with is a common enemy, and the common enemy is Christ, the Word. And the Word will be indirectly attacked through the attack on the text, the formal words. So the attack on the great tradition on Western civilization is an indirect way of trying to undo the incarnation and the atonement. And it, it can't undo what happened at Calvary over 2,000 years. They can't undo it. But what the devil can do is to destroy, get the, get the creatures, the deceived, to destroy themselves. So it is a satanic agenda. I'm being pretty unambiguous about this. It is a demonic idea, and the idea begins by looking at culture not as revelation, not through the prism of the word of God, but rather as a, an expression of human creativity. And note that's what C.S. Lewis does in Paralandra, by the way. He gets the woman to imagine herself as an actor in a grand scheme and as a, having an important role to play and imagining things could be different than the way they are. So he wants to get her into an imagination that is at odds with reality. And it slowly, insidiously has an effect. What, uh, the unmanned, Ransom, not Ransom, um, Weston, is persuading her to think of herself in abstraction from herself as a part in a, and it slowly starts to have an effect on her because it's, it's to some extent appealing. It appeals to certain features of her human nature. And the idea of the noble sacrifice that she will make, as if the noble sacrifice has not already been made by Christ. I think Lewis is actually demonstrating in Paralanda the war with the word in that exchange between uh, Eve and Satan. That's what he's doing. He's showing what's going on in the humanities. 
That's my contention. Any comments or questions? Because I'm going to cut it off short today, if, if, that's, if you have nothing. Yes, sir. Um, well, I, no, I wasn't saying it was a reaction against the Renaissance. It's still within the context of the Renaissance. And I don't think the Reformation, which initiates or tends to be identified with Luther, is conceived as a reaction against the Renaissance. It's a reaction against a certain understanding of, of the Christian faith in relation to the work of Christ. And he's saying that um, it's not, it, it's related in the sense that the Renaissance is man-centered and the Reformation is saying, no, 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 it's God-centered. God did this at the cross and you're, mis you're misrepresenting the significance of the cross and by doing so you're misrepresenting how meaningful man can be in the scheme of creation and how meaningful he can be, how significant. He can't do anything. He's hopeless. He needs to be delivered. He needs to repent, but he needs to be delivered from a bondage that he cannot of himself escape. And in that sense, he, he's accusing the Catholic Church of his day of being too man-centered. That, and that's the point. But it's not a reaction against the Renaissance. It may be a reaction against the influence of the Renaissance on the Catholic Church of the day. That might be. But he doesn't couch it in those terms. It's more of a question of, you know, no, it's you are placing it in in human terms that we can do certain things to appease God, hence the fight over the indulgences and and purgatory and all that, and the 95 Thesis nailed the Wittenberg door and so forth. It's about that issue, but really behind that, it's about what goes on in the, uh, at Good Friday and the atonement. And he says that you are saying that we can please God through works, but it's, it's, it's justification by faith alone in, in the work of Christ alone. That's where it is. Now, so I think it is a reaction against the Renaissance, but he doesn't present it that way. But the man-centeredness, absolutely. That, that is what is at stake there. And it's not because they're against art, but it's more the man-centeredness. And it's presented in theological terms. And I am just suggesting it has more significant implications than it might appear in terms of the arts and culture and um, society in general. But that's not the focus of Luther. Luther is very sharply focused. Yeah. It's less focused on being real, strictly realistically human, and it's more symbolic of the spiritual realities behind that, right? But then with um, the Renaissance, it seems like it's still focusing a lot on Christ and the saints, but emphasizing more of Christ's human nature and the fact that he became man, right? So did, and I guess like with that aspect, I don't, I guess I don't see how that can be construed as problematic unless it's seen as being sacrilegious. He sees it as a salvation issue. He's, you know, is it, can we, what can we do to redeem ourselves? Is there something that we can do? Now, in the teaching of obviously the man that eventually the church deplores, this preacher of indulgences, they say, yeah, he's totally. He's, he's gone way outside his mandate, and he shouldn't have been saying what he said. But Luther's saying, yes, but you haven't repudiated the doctrine of purgatory. And the doctrine of purgatory is not in Scripture, and it's teaching that you, that you can do something to, to, to alleviate the problem of hell. And you can't, because, that's, because it's already been done. That has been done. And if you're suggesting you can 
do something to add to that in some way to reduce the time, then you haven't understood the significance of that event and what Christ came to do because he has totally absolved you from all sin. And it can't be, un what he did can't be undone and you can't add to it. By adding to it, you're suggesting that something was lacking in the original situation and there was nothing lacking to it. All sin was destroyed there. Or sin was. Sins continued. But sin was destroyed and death as a consequence. Now, people continue to sin, people continue to die, but the, cat, the broader category, the idea, if you will, the, fo the great form, that has been destroyed. And as a consequence, by faith, the, the, the deaths and sins that come after that are, are undone, they're deprived of their power. That's really what's going on there. But there, just to show you that in the Renaissance, there was a backlash even within this, in, in, in uh, Florence itself, there was something called the Bonfire of the Vanities. Um, where, where they were throwing religious art because people were getting distracted. So there was a, an awareness that the, the humanism of, the, of Florence, that, which I adore, I love Florence. I just, I, it's my paradise on earth in terms of beautiful place. Food, I mean everything. Um, there is an awareness that there's something deeply wrong with this. And they, that here they're trying to burn it. That's a sort of a very religious expression against the humanism. Luther's is more of a, an intellectual. Say, yeah, but what's the root of this? It's not just the sins, it's the problem of sin. Let's focus it to this. And what did the scriptures say? And so he's taking this word. But that, anyway, that's what, it, and that's what I mean though by the reaction against the Renaissance. It's more against humanism. But in the, in, not in the sense of that it's degrading humanity, but in the sense that it sees Christ as the exaltation of humanity. So it's his humanity, it's a, it's a proper humanism then, as opposed to the Renaissance humanism, which is too much focused on ideal human form and so forth, which is vanities. He's, a, he's agreeing, in a sense, with, with, the, with the contagion that is unleashed by the Renaissance. The Enlightenment loves the Renaissance. You'll, they never say anything bad with it. They love the focus on hum humanity because they see that Christian, Christian doctrine is, is not going to attribute anything salvific to humanity, and they can't tolerate that idea. They want to save, our, save us through reason, pure reason, okay? Whatever you think of it, that's what's going on here. I think we're past our time. So thanks. Uh,